cool and full person, this is Anton, and welcome back to Mars. Today we're going to be discussing some of the recent discoveries in regards to the red planet, and specifically the discoveries in regards to the unusual dust storms that we've observed on Mars, the new discoveries about the aurora on Mars, and even the discoveries in regards to the amount of radiation on the surface of this planet, and what we can do to try to prevent the radiation poisoning for future astronauts. With all of these studies in regards to all of this, as always, in the description below. And let's start with the most recent finding in regards to the dust storms. The unusual phenomena that are present on Mars during certain seasons, which can sometimes encompass the entire planet. For example, this iconic image from 2001 shows us what Mars sort of looks like before and during the dust storm. And we know that it can potentially cause some major problems for a lot of things operating on the surface. As you might be aware, in June of 2018, NASA has lost one of its major probes. The Opportunity rover that was active on Mars since 2004 unfortunately lost its ability to generate energy due to a massive dust storm in the mid-2018, which even during daytime would make these skies appear as you see them on the right with Mars once again transforming so much that you couldn't even see the surface anymore. The image on the right here shows you what it looked like during the storm. And for the opportunity that relied on its solar panels, here's what the skies would look like from the surface. There would be practically no sun whatsoever. Here's roughly how much energy was produced during this time, and notice how by June 10th, when the storm was at its peak, the amount of energy generated was only 22 watts. That's from the almost 700 watts generated in the beginning. But this being the last image taken by the Opportunity on June 10th of 2018. And now we have this other probe called Insight that's basically facing a very similar problem, with the dust slowly causing the probe to shut down over time. And because any future Martian mission would probably have to rely more on solar panels as opposed to a lot of other ways to generate energy such as nuclear power, it means that the scientists have to really figure out how these Martian storms operate, how to predict them, and more importantly, what we can possibly do to prevent their effects, or maybe find areas around Mars where the effects are not as dramatic. And so this recent study that you can find in the description tries to figure out exactly what causes these storms to become so powerful, and what seasonal changes trigger certain dust storms. And this study relies on something known as the seasonal energy imbalance also sometimes referred to as the radiant energy budget, with the main explanation being the solar energy, the amount of solar energy absorbed and released by the planet itself. So essentially it focuses on this balance between the absorption of energy and the release of energy. For example, we know that for our own planet, in terms of the seasonal and daily variations between the amount of energy absorbed and released from the sun, the so-called energy imbalance is approximately 0.4%. In other words, there is a little bit of a difference in terms of seasonal changes between how much energy is absorbed and released, with all of this being actively regulated by the planet itself through various gases in the atmosphere and through the presence of, for example, ice and snow on the surface, which tends to reflect light. But because it's about 0.4%, it means that our planet can generally maintain a relatively constant temperature. But Mars seems to have very strong seasonal and even daily variations in terms of the amount of energy that's radiated back from Mars. In other words, once in a while, the planet seems to have a very large imbalance, up to about 15.3%. Which means that in between seasons, the amount of energy absorbed versus reflected can change by about 15.3%, and that is a huge imbalance compared to planet Earth with just 0.4%. This means that once in a while, during certain seasons, there is an excess of energy on the surface of the planet, and this could be one of the potential mechanisms generating these massive dust storms. For example, during the huge dust storm in 2001, the scientists discovered that the amount of power that was emitted from the planet decreased by 22% during daytime, but also increased by 29% during nighttime, with even more variation between seasons. So this could be the mechanism that's causing these storms to become so powerful, although the actual process is still unknown. Well, you have to remember, this is still a correlation study, not a causation study. And so trying to understand how this energy imbalance might affect other planets, and also obviously figuring out exactly what this imbalance is for all of the planets in the solar system, could be one of the potential future studies, and could help us understand how all of this works. 
But dust storms is just one of many problems we would have to deal on Mars if we were to establish a permanent human colony on the surface. We also have the issue of radiation, cosmic radiation, coming from both the Sun and a lot of powerful objects around the universe. And because both NASA and even China are now planning to send astronauts to Mars, both agencies are quite interested in trying to figure out how to potentially protect human life from exposure to a lot of radiation in the process. At the moment it's believed that some of the first crewed missions might actually happen around the year 2033 and potentially then also in 2035 and 2037. Those are the years when Mars is going to be at just the right position for future missions to be launched from Earth. And so when it comes to trying to protect astronauts living here from potential radiation, there are obviously several solutions, although none of them currently would be very, very effective. First of all, there is a bit of an atmosphere on the planet. And surface pressure on Mars does change quite a lot depending on where you are. Certain locations which are much higher up, in this case visible in blue, will have much lower pressure and thus more radiation on the surface whereas the much lower regions will usually contain much higher pressure and thus more atmosphere to absorb some of the cosmic rays coming from distant regions. Which means that we should probably try to aim to launch some of the crewed missions to some of these lower regions, such as for example in different deep craters where the surface pressure is already higher and thus a lot less protection is needed to create a livable habitat. And specifically here we're talking about the shielding that's required further on. And in this case, the shielding is probably going to be made from the regolith on Mars, with the best type of habitat very likely being underground. And here the scientists determined that the depth has to be at least 1 meter deep to possibly 1.6 meters, mostly because anything smaller than that can still create what's known as the cosmic ray showers. Basically, when the cosmic ray hits the, for example, some kind of a shield, and then starts to create a lot of secondary particles, and produces a relatively high neutron flux inside the spaceship or inside the habitat. Something that in this case the scientists believe peaks at around 30 centimeters or approximately one foot in depth. Which means that any kind of a protection on Mars has to be more than that, preferably at least one meter or three feet thick. And so by combining the information about the surface pressure with the maps of radiation on Mars, the scientists determined that some of the best locations for a potential future mission would probably be low-lying regions such as the famous Valles Marineris that you see right here that doesn't just have high surface pressure on the inside but also has recently been discovered to potentially possess water deposits somewhere in these regions as well. So it's very likely that some of the first crewed missions might actually be landing somewhere near this and then developing the first Martian colonies inside the valley itself. And since this is a pretty large structure, there is quite a lot of real estate to choose from. But obviously, because this is still a decade away, we don't really know where all of this goes just yet. And last but not least, we also have certain discoveries in regards to the mysterious Martian aurora. The aurora that seemed to be mostly visible in the UV light, but seemed to always appear on the night side of the planet. And are definitely not produced in the same way like planet Earth. More importantly, the recent discoveries from the HOPE mission have also found that certain aurora on Mars are very different both in shape and in appearance. But since Mars doesn't have any magnetosphere, it's always been kind of difficult to explain how these aurora are formed. Naturally, because on Earth, all of this is due to the magnetosphere of the planet and the aurora generally follow the magnetic lines. And so in this case, the scientists used a lot of data collected by the MAVEN mission that's been orbiting Mars for a while now, with the probe itself also collecting data on the solar wind, which was also used for this study. And here they mostly compare the pressure of the solar wind and the UV data from Martian auroras, as well as the strength and the angle of various minute magnetic fields generated on the surface of Mars as a result of various solar activity. And it looks like, as a lot of scientists thought originally, the aurora here are essentially produced by very localized magnetic fields that seem to occur only in certain regions of the Martian crust, and usually in southern hemisphere. And this magnetic field is usually created from the interaction with the solar wind with the aurora more or less concentrated near the areas that the scientists refer to as the strong crustal field regions, visible in this rectangle right there. And it looks like inside these regions, the aurora occurrence mostly depends on the orientation of the solar wind and the magnetic field. In other words, it becomes relatively easy for the scientists to predict the occurrence of the aurora. 
But outside of these regions, the aurora seem to be more connected to the overall pressure from the solar wind itself. So it looks like there are at least two ways of generating aurora on the surface of the planet, with the most powerful predictor being the sun itself. The more powerful the coronal mass ejection, the more stuff comes toward Mars, the more likely the aurora are to appear somewhere on the surface. Although interestingly, the power of the coronal mass ejection doesn't seem to influence the brightness of the aurora. With the aurora generated inside these crustal magnetic regions, very likely being generated through various magnetic reconnection events kind of similar to planet Earth. But the mechanism itself is not super clear yet. It's just clear that these particular regions with higher content of various magnetic particles do seem to play a role. Although exactly what's producing these regions is also not clear yet because nobody has ever dug into those areas yet. But all of this is to some extent connected to what we are planning to do on Mars in the next few decades. A mission to Mars. A crewed mission to Mars with astronauts very likely staying there for at least a few months. So by studying all of this and by discovering what conditions a human body will have to experience on the surface of this planet is of course really important in order to determine how we can safely both deliver and then return the astronauts from this planet. But at least for now all of this is still very preliminary. We still don't really have a very good plan for how all of this will be executed, but hopefully in the next decade all of this will become a little bit more obvious. And so until future studies or until future discoveries, that's all I wanted to mention. Check out all of the relevant links in the description below and check out some of the previous discoveries about Mars in the video somewhere right there or in the description as well. Subscribe, maybe share this video with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else and support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow and as always, bye bye.